This podcast contains content that may be disturbing to some audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Dave, if you're listening, uh, we're having a little bit of a challenge in that Melissa has to, is a little late at the dentist. Um, hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. <laughs> What am I looking at? What is going on here? Okay, so first of all, welcome. And it appears that Melissa's dental appointment went a little longer. I'm so sorry. I I had a cracked tooth. I had to get in. I thought I'd be done by now. Do you you guys want to bump it uh, and do it again another day? I'm fine with that if you need to. I'm I'm good. I'm I'm. We're done. I just have to go. Sorry, I I had a cracked tooth. It was not supposed to take two hours. It was no supposed worries. to take an hour. Now, do you prefer I refer to you as Dr. Morgan today or Melissa? Dr. No, Melissa just Morgan, Melissa. Double just M's? Melissa. What do we, okay, just Melissa. All right. By the way, we met once at, at Phenomicon in Vernal, Utah. Oh, very cool. I'll be back there this year. You know what you need now, though? I have your book. Look, you signed dun, it for me, dun, Melissa, the ghost dun. doctor. My new book is out, Theater of the I Mind. I know. Whoa. I saw your new book. I'm so excited for it. Yeah, that's one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about today, Perfect. actually. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Would Would you mind telling us a little bit about your new book? Well, thank you. It's what a surprise that you'd start off asking that. Uh, I know, yeah, right? I've got a brand new, brand new book called Theater of the Mind. Tales from the Darkness, and it is a collection of some of my favorite strange supernatural stories, Uh, having curated stories now for the last 18 years once I began doing paranormal radio. uh, I had all of these great stories that people would share with me, and I used to put them on my show in this thing called Theater of the Mind, where I would read the story dramatically, and we would have sound effects and music, and uh I just decided, you know, these stories are languishing. If you haven't found the show, these are great stories that should be heard. And uh, I reached out to the authors of the stories, and many of them sent me kind of like a bare bones email story. And I asked them, do you mind if I flesh this out a little bit? Um, Not changing the direction of the story, not changing the outcome, not changing the experiences, but just making it more of a narrative, more colorful, if you will. And, uh, that was especially because we we're doing it as as a soundscape. So I would just add things like, as Melissa walked up the the long dusty road, you could hear the sound of the rocks crunching beneath her feet, the wind whipping through the trees, and somewhere in the background, a horse whinnied. And he would just have you know <laughs> my, my producer would chop in all those sound bits so that it would just give you something more to kind of walk you through it as we were doing the stories. But then I backed off a lot of that stuff and just kind of curated the stories to make them stand alone as a as a story that you would read in a book. And uh, I was I'm very flattered by the people and many of them want to remain anonymous because they are still feeling embarrassed or like people will judge them for being out about their own personal experiences. But a lot of the the comments I've gotten over on Amazon are from uh, some of the people who submitted these stories and they're like, you got my story, right? You know, thank you so much. This, this kind of gives that life again. So, I, and I didn't want it to just be a book of ghost stories. So the, the tapestry is much too rich. So I, I incorporated time slip phenomena, doppelgangers, uh, Ooh. ghosts, UFOs, aliens, two totally different type of stories. Um, my own personal experience. And so there's, there's a bunch of different cool things, including a haunted doll story. So I just try to make it something that would give you a different vibe, every story. And there's 15 tales in the first book. That is amazing. Thank I'm you. excited to read it because this one is, is pretty good. <laughs> what a ringing endorsement, doc. This one is <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, that's I mean, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. That's what I meant to say. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, well, I wrote that one, The Other Side, I think 12 years ago, uh, along with Patrick Burns and Marley Gibson. Uh, Uh We spent a haunted weekend at the Palmer House Hotel in Minnesota. And 
sat down and just started punching out this book to make it a fun, light, easy read, but going over why we ghost hunt, how we ghost hunt, what kind of tools we use, what we should do and shouldn't do, setting up protocols, looking and evaluating evidence properly. And we took a lot of heat when we released it because the book is written for everyone, you know, veterans and newbies in the paranormal field. Uh, And the publisher saw it uh, fit to change the title the day it went to printing. So it became the other side, a teen's guide to ghost hunting in the paranormal. And people were living. Why would you get teens involved? This is demonic. This is, this is how they're going to. And I said, how many of you began by having experiences as a kid or a teenager? My kids love to go paranormal investigating. And my, my brother who I did a podcast with also, his teens also love it. And we feel like, Hey, it's part of our world. It's part of how we grew up. Let's not make them scared of it. Let's let's uh, take them on these adventures and see. Oh, hang on. Is Dave gone? I can't see Dave. I haven't seen him. Shenanigans okay. are taking place. You know place what? Today. I my personal opinion is that the ghosts are all riled up today. Okay, <laughs> they're here. It's leap they're day. In our computers. It's leap day. No, it's like that right. scene in Zoolander when uh when they're like, it's in the computer, it's yeah. that, but make it ghosts. <laughs> yeah, the so, ghost in the machine. Yeah, I totally, uh, I don't know what's going on. It's strange. Sometimes the connectivity issues and doing radio for 18 years, I've had some very weird things happen while we're doing the shows. And uh, from live EVP, uh, electronic voice phenomena to, uh, you know, strange electronic glitches. Well, in one of the interviews, as I was talking video style to my guest and she's talking to me, I could start to see something moving in her glasses. There was a reflection of someone in front of her that was not there. And uh, so, yeah, it's been fun. It's been a, a wild ride. And when you get to have these little moments where things just keep going strange, we need to just embrace it. Embrace yes, the do. weird. That's that's embrace what we're all here for. Mm-hmm. Do you remember... What was the strangest of those EVPs? Do you have one in mind on your yeah. radio show? Uh, Betty Andreasen Luca, who was a famed UFO abductee, her and her husband had both dealt with that. Um, and I was inter- interviewing them both. They were in the same house on the phone, two different phones, two different rooms. And Betty got done telling a story and then she threw it over to her husband. And I heard something and I stopped and I said, Betty, I'm sorry, Betty, did you say something? She said, no. And I said, maybe you whispered under your breath. She goes, no, guarantee. I didn't say a thing. I said, well, ask my husband. And that's the last thing I said. So I go, interesting. Okay. So I told my producer, Mark that. And we continued on with the interview. And we went to the next commercial break. I said, pull that audio up. And he looked and he said, I don't see anything here, D. There's, and I said, blow it up, turn up the volume. And he turned it up and his face got just blown out. And he goes, what? He isolated it, boosted the volume, and I brought them back on. And I'm like, so remember when I heard that voice after you were done, Betty? And she said, yeah. And I go, this is what we caught. And you hear Betty say, no, you should definitely ask my husband. I'm going to kill you. And then he starts talking. Yeah. So it was this, I'm going to kill you threat. It was really that we were all like, Yeesh! and they're like, Oh, thanks. That's, that's over here in our house. And I'm like, I guess so. Or maybe there's an angry ghost in the radio station who just doesn't like this interview. I don't know, but that was one of my favorite. Make you stop and think moments. Could you tell which mic it came from? No, no. no? Cause I, I believe Weird. it came from one of their phones. So oh. we, yeah, this was back when I was on actual radio. So they were, like I said, one was in one room of the phone oh. and the other was in another room of the phone, separated opposite ends of the house. So their audio wouldn't bleed over. So it, my guess would have been her because it sounded feminine to me when I heard it the first time, uh, being a father of 11 kids, I've heard a lot of mutterings under breath and a lot of threats, uh, God, I would like to beat you up, you know? So I've all, uh, I just knew I heard something and it sounded feminine to me, but when we played it back, it was just this, I'm going to kill you. Oh my gosh. Whispery Speaking voice. of yes. father of 11 kids. I mean, yeah. I have three. Mm-hmm. Carly has three. Mm-hmm. How in the world? Well, I had a full head of hair when I began. <laughs> so. Tell us about that. Like, what is it like being Having a, a full head of hair? A- I wish I could. It's been <laughs> well, so no, long. No, no. 
I don't care hair. that you don't have hair. No. I, I, mine all fell out at one time too. But uh, <laughs> just being a father of eleven kids, I want to mm. know what it's like raising eleven kids. Okay. Um, I, <laughs> the best answer I ever heard came from Jim Gaffigan, and he said, "Imagine that you're treading water and holding on to ten kids, and somebody throws you an eleventh kid." That's kind of what it feels like. I'm constantly <laughs> juggling, trying to stay afloat and and not kill somebody. So that's pr- pretty much it. Now I have I have sired. Ooh, that sounds fancier than it does. Sired, I've sired okay. seven children, uh, adopted one, and then wow. I have three stepchildren. So cool. uh, yeah. So oh oh, I'm less impressive now, ladies, because it's not eleven. No, of I my didn't feet. say that. that a- no, no, no. <laughs> you both look like oh it, mm, oh he only had seven. No. Big deal. I'm still trying to lose seven. the baby weight too. Only so. seven. I yeah. mean, I had no. three and I can barely handle it. So yeah. good job, Dave. Thanks. <laughs> I can't take uh, the credit. It's been uh, the women in my life that have been a, a huge part of that. So uh, my kids have been very supportive of allowing me on the road and letting me do the things that I love and and supporting me on this journey as well. So I've been lucky to have family that uh, that's good. Yeah. Are any of your kids interested in the paranormal? Or are they just like, eh, that's dad's thing? Um, my oldest son is kind of, he's fascinated by it, but he doesn't want to have an experience. Uh, and he gets freaked out, and he, which is funny because he's a, um, a Navy veteran and he's a, a Minneapolis firefighter and he's a big strapping buck. And like <laughs> the last guy you'd think would be afraid of this stuff. And, uh, but uh, yeah, he's not keen on it, um, but he doesn't you know, have an issue with it. He's been to a few of my conferences that I used to host. And then uh, I think all of my kids have been there at some point at some of these conferences and the ones that are interested, I bring along and we do things. And the ones that aren't, I just let them be, you know, with as entrenched as my life is in the paranormal, I don't make it about that at home. I want them to come to me if they have questions, thoughts, concerns. Otherwise I don't want to uh, force my beliefs or my system down anybody's throat. It's I'm just here. I'm dad. Um, you know, the fun moments for me are when their friends know who I am and it's kind of embarrassing to them. So that, that those are the fun <laughs> moments, you know? Yeah. I love, I love moments like that. My kids always, their friends always want me to take them out to abandoned places and do investigations. And I'm like, yeah, okay, let's go. And then my kids are like, uh, yeah. mom, why do you gotta be I, so weird? I will tell you that it's, I've, I've had to be a lot more cautious, um, you know, we're in a weird world right now and you have to be very, very cautious. So I don't usually take my, my kids and their friends ghost hunting because I don't want to be in dark places with children, uh, you know, and, and God forbid a ghost grabs them or pushes them or something. And, you know, what parent's going to believe that it was a ghost and not that creepy bald guy that, you know, took all of (laughs) it. So I'm just, I just think it's best if I let my kids do their thing. I take my children and we'll go have fun. And, uh, my, my girls are great. Uh, they're very respectful. We were at the Palmer house one night and we were doing an investigation and we weren't getting any of the regular contact we would normally get. And we had a spirit box going on the bed and nothing was coming through. And my daughter, Pacey, she just looks up and she goes, um, you know, Raymond, if you don't want us here, just tell us to leave and we'll leave. And very clearly get out. She goes, okay. <laughs> she reached over, turned it off. Come on, dad, we got to go. He said, we, we get out. So when the ghost told my daughter to get out, we respected it. We got out of the room. And I love that my kids have that healthy respect for the supernatural. I, I feel like that speaks to you as an investigator and as a father too, because they've clearly learned that from you. <laughs> and yeah, the instant, okay, we're done. I love that. That is the way that I try to operate too. If I'm not wanted, I'll say, all right, (laughs) I'm so curious, but okay, bye. (laughs) I I have a big question. So uh, you you were talking about being pushed possibly. Right. Um, I remember your investigation of the Whaley house on the holster Mm -hmm. files. Yes. So that room where you got pushed, I actually had a paranormal experience there, but I want to hear about that well this was weird all the way around right i mean i was approached uh to be on a tv show and i turned it down um and they're like what why everyone wants to be on tv and i said i really don't you know i don't want to just be on another ghost hunting show there's enough of those and they're like no this one's different i'm like how well it's going to be three of you in these haunted spots i go i think that's called ghost adventures Right. And they're like, no, no, uh, we're going to have a medium. It's going to be you and a tech and a medium. And I'm like, all right, that's, 
a little different, but I still, it just feels very cookie cutter to me. And they couldn't tell me. So then they sent me over this big, thick non-disclosure agreement to sign. I signed it. And then they called me up and said, we're going to reopen Dr. Hans Holzer's files. We've got the blessing of his family and his daughter, Alexandra is part of the show. And I was friends with Alexandra and I'm like, this is awesome. Count me in. What do we have to do? And, um, so our very first episode, I mean, from the time they made that call and I signed my contract to when we started filming was like within 45 days. And that was my first real meeting with Cindy, although I knew of her and of, with Shane, although I knew Shane and knew of him, I had never worked with either one of them. And our first place is the Whaley house, which I wasn't thrilled with going to, because again, I felt this thing's been done to death. What can we possibly tell about the Whaley house that hasn't already been told? Everybody's already told Hans Holzer's story. And they said, well, that's your job. You're the investigator. Let's go in and find it. So we went in and we uncovered things and found what we believe to be the spirits that are haunting it. Many people have visited the Whaley house in San Diego, deemed one of the most haunted houses in America because Dr. Hans Holzer deemed it as such. And he went there with Regis Philbin who had paranormal experiences as a journalist. And um, he just really had a lot of stuff go on. So, so many people go there trying to communicate with the ghosts of the Whaley family. When we were there and I was talking to the historian and I asked, I said, so was it, Haunted, you know, are, are we only hearing the stories of the Whaley family? She goes, it's interesting you bring that up because we just recently took possession of these letters from the Whaley's back and forth to one another where they talk openly about the ghosts that were in the house while they lived there. And really? that had never been revealed before. So that was exciting to me. I never and, heard that either. And then yeah. the ghost of Yankee Jim is kind of the main ghost. Everybody goes there to communicate with Yankee Jim or the uh, the family, and uh, we uncovered a totally different story. Uh, it's a real story. It all happened. Mr. Whaley was there for it, and um, it was a powerful story, and we called the spirit out, and uh, he knocked me to the ground. I, I thought that somebody had come around behind me in the dark with one of the cameras because it was so heavy. I thought maybe a cameraman tripped on the carpet and hit me because I, boom, I went like, flying into Shane and hit the ground flying is maybe an exaggeration. I slump into Shane and then fall forward. Um, and Shane goes, I thought that old man had a heart attack. Uh, you know, and they were all worried, <laughs> worried that they just watched me die on the first episode. That was the first episode. Yeah. That's the first one we filmed. And you see oh. me turn and look because I'm half of me is irritated. Cause I'm like, you just messed up a really great scene. Pay attention. Don't knock me over, you know? And then when there's nobody there, my brain just kind of broke. I, I just stood up and I'm like, I, I got to think about this. And I went outside and just tried to wrap my head around what happened. Um, the, the initial reaction was I kind of just wanted to go and not be there. But I, I was like, no, Dr. Holzer wouldn't do that. And we can't walk in this place of fear. So I, I went back in that night and I said, all right, Juan Verdugo, I know you're here. You got my attention. You're not going to scare me out. I'm, I'm, I'll be back. But if there's something you want to tell me, if there's something that you want to share that can help me understand your story, just talk to me. You don't have to beat me up. And then we got a really great story out of it. And, and, you know, I felt more empowered by taking back that power. And unfortunately they didn't film that bit of me going back in, which I wish they would have, because I'd like people to not always walk in a place of fear. So that was it. Yeah. But it, it still took a while for me to wrap my head around the fact that something physically shoved me into Shane. I was going to say, have you ever had that happen before? Never before that. No, I've had that wow. spider web feeling when you're walking in a dark place and it feels like you walk into a cobweb and there's nothing there. I felt like a gentle breeze blow by me. And the only other thing I would liken this to, uh, and, and it's apples and oranges, is when I was at Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Louisville, Kentucky. And it was one of my first trips there. And I'm walking down this dark hallway on the lowest level with the owner. And she goes, Schrader, turn off your light. We're going to look for shadow people. And at this point, I was not a big believer in shadow people because I know how the eyes work. And I know that they're constantly looking for light source. And then we've got all those little particulates floating in our eyes. And if you're light sources are changing and you're walking, you can mistake a little hair in the corner of your eye for somebody walking by. And I just, you know, I was not overly impressed with the, the concept of shadow people. And she goes, look at that. Look. And I looked and in a door frame, it looked like this head and shoulders. 
kind of leaning back and forth, looking out at me. And I was, I was baffled. I'm like, what, what exactly am I looking at here? And, uh, then I, I thought, well, listen, it's a full moon. I can hear the wind outside and that side of the building didn't have windows. I think what I'm seeing is a shadow of a branch bobbing back and forth. And I didn't want to be rude to my host. I'm like, oh, yeah, Tina, that's cool. And as I turned and started to walk, there was a full three-dimensional shadow figure walking at me. And our shoulders went through each other. And I pivoted around. And I wish I wish I had a Hollywood moment like there were sparkles or I farted <laughs> or something happened that made me realize that something had just passed through me that was not Taco Bell. And it didn't. It just kept moving <laughs> on the hall. And I turned and I looked at her and I said, what the hell is that? And she goes, oh, that's our resident shadow person, Big Black. And all of a sudden, you couldn't see the end of the hallway. Boom, pitch black. The entire wow. hall was pitch black. And then you could see the end of the hallway again. That was surprising, but I didn't feel physical touch. This, at the Whaley House, something chucked me into Shane. I was in that same room. I was. We were on a tour. We were at the end of the tour. Everybody was down the hallway, and I'm like just taking pictures and stuff. And all of a sudden, I feel this warm breeze in my ear, and it goes, <sighs> and I thought it was my son. And I turned around, and I'm like, that was weird. Don't do that. And nobody was there. But I felt a, <sighs> and the whole yeah. time I'm thinking, I hope something paranormal happens. I hope something paranormal happens. Well, that, that area, that arch that you're under is where mm-hmm. the um, hangman's noose was, where the, the uh, gallows oh. stood. Yeah, so I don't the, think I knew that. Yeah, well, that's why Mr. Whaley got the – he bought that property for like something ridiculous like 10 bucks because they had hung two or three people on that Gosh. property, and it was stigmatized property. So he got it for a steal, and that's where Yankee Jim's story kind of comes in and why they believe Yankee Jim might have been the one haunting the house. I think Yankee Jim was there, and I think I had an encounter with him upstairs that was very weird. But the knockdown, I think, was Juan Verdugo. And here's a guy who, you know, was misunderstood, misrepresented is probably the better word. Here were these Mexican uh, settlers. They were the people that lived there. And they were pushed off that property by the encroachment of the white man as we pushed our way through and just took areas. And Juan Verdugo was part of a group of men that decided, screw this, we're taking our property back. And they came over and we caught them and uh, hung a couple, shot a couple. We made the Juan Verdugo, I believe it was, we made him dig his own grave and then stand in front of the grave as Mr. Whaley and three other men shot him to death. So wow. his house his house has a view of the cemetery where these men are laid to rest. Uh, so it's it's very disarming and dis, you know unsettling, but it was great to get a chance to go back in and hear history and let history breathe and have a voice again and 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 tell these stories. But in that area, multiple people have passed out uh, or felt extremely nauseous and bothered without knowing why. There's no clue that there was something about that part of the house. But I'm not surprised to hear you had something strange happen. That's that's what has been known to occur. Crazy haunted place. It could be what? this, Melissa. It what? could be the fact that time slip took place. And in that <sighs> moment, you felt that hot breath on your neck. It was Dave Schrader getting hit by a ghost. <laughs> and going, <laughs> and boom. And I love just, that theory. We talk about time slips all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's like actually that. one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, about time slips or the idea that timelines can overlap. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I've heard, I've heard you talk a little bit about this before and I found mm-hmm. it absolutely fascinating. So I was wondering if you could just give your general ideas on time slips or timelines overlapping, whichever way the wind blows you. <laughs> I, I've got to come up with a better story or not a better story. Cause the story I always tell is great, but I've said it a thousand times. So if anybody has heard me on this one before, it'll, it'll, uh, It always bears repeating, but I feel like I've repeated the living hell out of it. It's now haunting (laughs) me, this story. But uh, to give you maybe a a different view, I was just talking um, to my friend Neil Story, who is a historian and paranormal researcher in England. And we're going to be doing an event together later this year. Uh, We're doing this eerie England tour. And then during our tour, we're going to be stopping off at the Festival of the Unexplained. 
to do a, a paranormal conference, the premier UK paranormal conference over there. And we were talking about our visit to uh, the Hellfire Caves in uh, in England and how weird our experience was. At one point, we got EVP of what sounded like children talking and one of them talking about the zoo. And he goes, now, what sense would that make? Why? What? And I said, well, Neil, you're trying to think of it in a, a different linear fashion. You're looking at, you know, did they bring a bunch of kids in here and do horrible things? Were they murdered? Was this? I said, what if, what if this was a field trip for a bunch of children that came here? They were hoping to go to the zoo and instead they're walking around in a dank, moldy, you know, musty old cave. And we just captured that moment because that that location, I always say it's like a book, right? So the the bottom cover is the beginning of time. The top cover is when everything goes and it's all done. But in between those are all the pages and all the stories and all the things that take place. So in that cave, it has always existed and always will exist. But on that day, Dave Schrader, Neil Story might have come into contact with a bunch of fourth graders from 1973 that were there doing a, a pass through field trip. And we captured their conversation. It had nothing to do with ghosts or dead people as we like to think of them, but it had to do with an echo in time. And when you look at a place like this, it's moist, it's underground, there's the rocks and all the different stylings. And if you believe in the stone tape theory, um, you know, the, the recording and now science is is examining the fact that things, inanimate objects, might have a consciousness or awareness, which means they may be witness to many different things. Everything has energy. Right. So they may be replaying these, these memories, and that might have been what I caught. But to me, that is a, an interesting example of a time slip. Um, it's something that's happening. Now, a real good time slip would have been if I would have rounded the corner and seen these kids and they would have seen me. You know, which I had happen at Waverly Hills. I was with two other investigators. Mm -hmm. We walked around a corner and a nurse came around and stopped and looked at us. Her eyes got huge and she turned and ran and just wow. gone. And isn't it amazing that Waverly Hills has been haunted all along? And the nurses and doctors used to talk about all the strange things they would see at night. The people wandering the halls. What if that's us, the paranormal investigators that are there yeah. every day? night. And that's why, you know, this nurse from 1950 rounds the corner in her tidy whiteies and her little white hat. And she runs into Beavis and Butthead and Dave Schrader <laughs> and <our> Metallica <laughs> and ACDC t-shirts. And we're all like, <laughs> what's going on? Right. Because <laughs> We've got a bunch of blinky lighty things and don't look like we belong there. So that's another moment of time slip phenomena in that moment. Who is truly haunting who? It isn't necessarily a ghost because why would her ghost be frightened of us? To me, mm -hmm. her time, she saw something and that something was us in our time. And in that one brief moment, the veils pass through one another and we, we were able to get a glimpse of what takes place. I love that theory. <laughs> now it's your turn to take a hit. Yeah. Uh <laughs> <laughs> the movie the others where they think they're being haunted but it's actually right. the other way around exactly mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's the whole concept of it is you know and, and i think there's there's different elements there's no one answer for what a ghost is that's why when i no. did the book too i didn't want to make it just a ghost story i didn't want to make it you know variances of ghost stories i wanted it to be all of it because i think the tapestry is all connected and i think if we start examining things on a broader spectrum instead of looking to pigeonhole everything that's where it really gets interesting in order to be a scientist especially a paranormal scientist you have to think outside the box and you have to look at everything you can't you can't just be in this one little hole where this is how it is and right. and this is what's happening so i love i love that theory that's awesome and for 1295 yeah. you can buy the dave schrader <laughs> i'm a supernatural scientist card and uh <laughs> impress your friends and neighbors i'm gonna get impress one dave i'm gonna get one <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to keep it in my wallet, whip it out. Nice. How have some of your beliefs in the paranormal changed from when you first got started to now? Were you always this open-minded in your early days or like the well, rest or at least like me, did you grow and evolve? Yes. 
to all. I, uh, you know, I started when I was two, two and a half having spiritual communication with my dead grandmother, um, and living in haunted houses and seeing things and being in the right place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the right time. And just having remarkable experiences, but I grew up in a very open household and there was no, uh, family wasn't hiding things. It wasn't a taboo subject. Mom always had, you know, a a book on the counter from some paranormalist, you know, Dr. William Roll or Hans Holzer or the Ed and Lorraine Warren or D Scott Rogo. And so there was always something around to kind of read. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, one of my fondest memories, um, my mom had the book, the Amityville horror sitting on the counter and I go up and I look at it and there's a big fly and I go, what's this about bugs? And she goes, no. She goes, but I don't want you, I don't want you to read that one. That one's a little too intense. And I'm like, really? She's like, yeah. So I took that seriously when my mom's like, this is too intense. And then years later, I become friends with Christopher Lutz, the youngest boy. And, uh, I got to introduce him to my mom and, uh, my mom goes, oh my gosh, let me go talk to him. And I go, I don't know, mom, his story's kind of intense and maybe, maybe you're too old for this. You're very old and brittle now. And she was like, shut up, dumbass. Just introduce me to Chris. And then what I did was uh, I threw Chris in my car and drove him to my house because we were at a conference in Chicago. And he goes, what are we doing? And I made him get out and he stood in front of my house and I took a picture of him in front of my house. And he goes, why did we do that? And I said, well, because I went to Long Island and I went to Amityville and I stood in front of your house and took a picture. I think it's only fair. So I have a picture of me in front of the Amityville house and a picture of Chris in front of my childhood home. So. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. It's the weird things that, in life and, that keep me, exp- you know, happy. And what a cool mom for reading those weird books. Right. I mean. Yeah. So I just, I've always been open to it. My aunt was a great influence. That's why in my new book, I reference the loving memory of my mom who we lost uh, in 2016 and the living memory of my aunt Judy, who's still alive and kicking and, and spurring me on. So, um, but I've, I've, I don't need to pigeonhole things anymore. I've also let go of ego in this field of, um, I don't, I'm not here to impress you and I'm not here to win you over to my side of belief. I will tell you my beliefs. And if those beliefs resonate with you, great. And if they don't, that's fine too. We can still part friends. So I don't feel I need anybody to believe my experiences and I don't necessarily have to believe your experiences, but I'm sure interested in why you believe you had an experience and what does it tell me about you and your life experiences. And, um, you know, I just, I just had a, a Dr. Jeff Tarrant on the show. And I'm reading his bio and here he was this kind of abused kid, alcoholic family members and bad stuff. And I started thinking, man, that's my life. And do you know how many people I know that have this, that are super into the paranormal? There's, there seems to be some common ground amongst us. Now that stuff fascinates me because it, it does seem like there are earmarkings to who might be more open and prone to the examples of experiencing the paranormal. So my sure. kids are probably never going to have a really good experience because I was such a loving father and never abused them. <laughs> my, my daughter's yeah. off screen looking at me going, <laughs> sorry, no paranormal for you. Daddy loves you too much. Sorry, sorry. You haven't, but that has been a common theme in people that we've spoken, our other guests on this show. And just something that I have noticed in life that people who have experienced trauma in one form or another are more open-minded and drawn towards the paranormal. Why do you think that is? Maybe it's because we're seeking clarity on why things happen and why they are the way they are. And we want to believe there's an outside influence, right? It, it's much easier to believe there's a demon behind the abuse we took. Uh, mm-hmm. it, you know, that's the psychological aspect. But we also want to understand it. And you want to understand, that's why our our fascination is so big into true crime as well. It could be anyone at any time. And you never know. It could be your neighbor. It could be your neighbor's kid. It could be your own father. You never know what's really going on out there. And, you know, if if you guys are cool with a woo-woo moment, I'll I'll Mm -hmm. do something with you and your your viewers and listeners right now. We love woo-woo. So let's talk about the time slip phenomena and... Let's talk about uh, uh, the issues that many of us in this field have. Now, I want, if everybody, if you're driving, pull over, 
or wait till you get home and listen to this point. Um, but I, I just want everybody to do me a favor right now. If you're listening to the show, I just want you to close your eyes for a few seconds. And I want you to take a deep breath slowly in through the nose. And I want you to hold it in your chest and then slowly exhale. Let it out through your mouth. And I want you to do two or three more of those. Just deep cleansing inhale and kind of sit yourself up so that you're sitting straight. You're not all slumped over. This isn't a moment to be on your cell phone or your computer. This is a moment for you. And now I want you to just kind of look into the darkness of your own mind. Sift through the memories that you have, memories that are painful. And I want you to find a memory that stands out to you the most. I want you to find a memory where you felt the most alone. You felt the most hurt. And you felt the most like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. And I want you to stand there in that inky blackness. And I want you to see that version of you that hurt version of you. And it may be from 30 years ago. It may be from last weekend. But I want you to see that version of you. And I want you to go approach that version of yourself. And if you're sitting down, I want you to sit next to yourself. If you're curled up on the floor, just get down next to yourself on the floor and wrap your arms and legs around yourself. And I want you to just hold on to that version of you. And just gently rock. I want you to tell that version, I know things are tough right now. We're going to get through this together. You're not alone. I'm here with you. I'll always be here with you. And we're going to get through this. And I want you to just be in that moment for a few seconds in silence. Now, the beauty is you can revisit this moment at any point, at any time, and maybe in your travels through your mind at that moment as we were walking through this you saw other moments you need to visit this is what i call time travel therapy now i want you to think about the times that when you felt alone there was kind of that little voice that little buzzing voice in the back of your head that was saying we're going to be okay we're going to be okay and maybe that was you and maybe the more you visit that maybe the stronger that that memory comes back to you of hearing that voice and feeling that sense because i believe time travel exists but i believe like quantum leap it exists within ourselves and that we can affect our past maybe not in a way that's going to kill hitler or save jfk but we're going to do something more important we're going to heal ourselves we we won't be in a delorean we'll just right. be right <laughs> right unless you were hurt in a DeLorean and you're visiting yourself at that moment. I don't know. Time's weird. Uh, but it's a big ball of timey, wimey, wibbly wobbly stuff, right? So why can't we join ourselves, be in those moments? Cause I thought about this. How many times do I lay there in bed, unable to sleep because of something that happened as a teenager? And I think, why, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I, and those echoes and echoes. And then I think back to those moments when I was a teenager laying there in bed after it happened, hearing those voices in my head, God, that was so stupid. Why did you do that. And I thought, well, if we spend all this time telegraphing bullshit messages back to ourselves, maybe it's time we start telegraphing good messages. Maybe it's time we start giving ourselves the love and compassion and empathy that we deserve. I love that. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing and, and you can do it anywhere, anytime. And I think it's, it's something that, well, not even, I think I've heard people have remarkable breakthroughs by having that that kind of moment to go back and see that. And it also gives you perspective and overview. You did make it. And in that most vulnerable moment, when you felt the weakest and most alone, you're still here. So you will make it, you will survive it. So I hope that people will take that as just a little gift from your buddy, Dave, and uh, maybe, you know, use it in your life. It's a, a manifestation intention and, uh, self clarity healing modality that I really believe in. That exercise was fascinating for several reasons. Um, the, the biggest part of my practice is what it, shadow work is was referred to shadow work, which is examining those painful moments and figuring out the way that it feels. And, but I never thought to try something like that. And when you had me do that, I very vividly pictured myself in my last house in Florida in a very painful time that I am I I've already worked out the hows and the whys. I felt that way, 
But I do remember laying there and feeling a comforting presence. And you know, I'm laying in my bed and I'm crying and I'm like, this is this is the actual worst, you know, right. and feeling that level of comfort. And just now with you, I'm like, well, son of a bitch. Was it me? Was that me? <laughs> right? Was that was, me? Was it me? Yeah. Quantum <laughs> just, entanglement, right? There you, you go. You, Quantum yeah. entanglement. You are a new body. Yeah, you, you're a new body. Every cell is rebuilt and redesigned. So I've, I've thought a lot about that too, that then do we buy into disease a little bit too readily? And I'm not trying to get all woo-woo and, and weird on you, but I think the fact is sometimes we can rebuild with a whole new set of us Legos, right? And we can choose yeah. how we go back and set that Lego up. Are we going to build it on shifting sands or are we going to build it on a more concrete environment of love and empathy and forgiveness? And let yourself realize it's okay to hurt today. It's okay to feel like crap and it's okay to let that go, but realize that that moment, that stumble is not what just defined who you were. It's how you stand back up, dust yourself off, look things in the face and say, screw you, I'm still here. That's what defines what a life you're going to lead. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's em empowering and an important thing that we should all uh, grasp and hold on to. I definitely agree with that. I'm going to have to experiment some more with that because um I, I have said several times that I'm not the person that I was when I experienced that trauma. I'm different now. Nope. I'm stronger now. I've been uh, I've been through it then and back and there and all around. So as quantum entanglement goes, then taking your healthier body and mind and soul back to that moment and imbuing that version of you with who you are now, A, proves that you're going to survive it, B, proves that you're strong, and C, gives you the will to continue on. Yeah, it's amazing. And I'm Dave Schrader. For $19.99, you can get my therapeutic massage knobs. <laughs> <laughs> that that was so interesting. And if you ever, you know, if you ever get a wild hair on your head to say, I'm going to lead, uh, you know, let's do this as but a group experiment. Is that a ball joke? Was that, was that a ball in. joke? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I got a couple wild hairs up there. You just got to say, yeah. hey, this bald hair, this bald head of mine is my choice. This is what I chose. <laughs> if those 11 kids, you hair. know. Sometimes I brush back my ghost hair like this. There you go. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with that. I do have a question about Devil's Perch. Yes. Uh, so I've been to Butte, Montana on mm -hmm. multiple occasions. It is a very, the energy in that city is very... Woo woo, woo woo. Right, right. Um, I want to hear about your most, um, your craziest experience or maybe like experience there that you want to talk about. <laughs> well, you know, how about something off the air? Uh, you can watch the TV show to see what happened to us. Uh, the Ghosts of Devil's Perch. It's on Travel Channel, Discovery Plus, and I think Tubi now, but I'm not sure. Max, that's the other one, uh, the Max streaming service. It's a really good series. I really Thank enjoyed you. it. You know, there is such a chaotic energy in Butte, and it was a place built mm -hmm. on lies, deceit, greed, lust, and it still permeates all of that. It's a lovely community, and there are beautiful, wonderful people that live there, so I'm not trying to cast dispersions, but I'm talking about the, the soil that they built this town on. And, you know, when you reap what you sow and that ground is tainted, you're going to see that come through. And I think that that's the hauntings that they deal with. And um, there were days when, you know, I love Cindy like a sister and she, me like a brother. And there were days, I don't think we could stand being in each other's presence, oh. and, but it wasn't that way when we were not, you know, you could get out of that area and it went away. I think there was such an agitation to it. And being sensitive as she is and growing in my own sensitivity, I think there was a lot of this frenetic anguish that we were feeling and picking up on and other people's um, stress and, and the spirit realm and the living realm and all of these things kind of are in one giant boiling steam pot. And hopefully we let off some steam there for the spirit realm and the humans to give them some answers. But I was really you know, impacted by the way that I watched it affect people around me. Um, but truly, you know, one of, one of the coolest moments I had was I have a necklace uh, that is a crucifix that has my mother's ashes in it. And I take, take that with me when I go on trips and do things. So I brought her with me on this trip, you know, to Butte, I Montana. Like that, actually. And uh, because she traveled with me and she loved the paranormal. So I'd love to take her with me when we're going to go do a new experience. So I'd take her with and, 
I got back to my hotel room and taken off my clothes from night, my necklace is gone. <gasps> and I'm like, what the hell? Oh. So I, I'm panicking. I'm like, okay, these are the places we filmed at today. And I text my, my, uh, director, Brian, I don't know what's going on, man. My, my mom's necklace with her ashes is missing. Let me go check. Cause we were between here and city hall. We were walking back and forth. So he literally went out for like an hour walking, looking for the glint of the silver crucifix and he couldn't find it. Nothing there. And he got back to his room, apologized. He's like, Dave, I can't find it. I mean, we can go look again tomorrow and see what we can uncover, but I couldn't find it. And then he got into bed and was laying in his bed in a totally different place. I mean, that was where we used as our headquarters was that church. And it was a, like a bed and breakfast. So he had his room in there. But he got up off his bed and he looked under his bed. And there was my mom's crucifix. Now, what's cool no is, way. what's really kind of cool is this is, that's a part two of a story. So you got the, you know, Star Wars, A New Hope without knowing the original story. Uh, what's cool to me is, I had had that bracelet uh, or I had worn it as a bracelet with the crucifix dangling as well. And I'd gone on the Walker stalker cruise walking dead tour. And we were on this cruise having a great time. And I got back and realized my, my necklace was gone and I was heartbroken about it. And one day I just went on Facebook and I messaged my mom's account. Cause I have control of her account. And I just sent her a heartfelt message. I miss you. I love Aww. you. I don't want to call on you because you need, you deserve the rest and, whatever you're going through. But you know, if there's any way to let me know you're still around, that'd be great. And then my son, Max lost his glasses and we couldn't find them anywhere. So we're asking everybody go, all right, kids go find it. Nobody could find them. I said, how about if I throw five bucks at whoever finds them? My kids scrambled like cockroaches. <laughs> my, my son on the shelf behind me, there's these little jars. They're Egyptian jars of life. They're the kind of jars that they would have taken hearts and brains and other parts and put them in. And, I have the jar of life over there. And my son goes, dad, I was looking for Max's glasses. And he brings me this little jar, which is obviously way too small. And he goes and look, and he takes the lid off and pours it out. And my mom's crucifix comes out. <gasps> no. no. Yeah. So I was like, what? So when I lost that brace or necklace, when I was filming in Butte and I told my director, I said, you know, can you find it? And he called me back and said, it's nowhere. I can't find it, Dave. I, I just, I, I said to my mom, I go, mom. I'm going to need your help again, you know, uh, otherwise you're staying in Butte, you oh, know, no. help me find you. And half an hour later, oh. Brian just got the whim to look, get up off his bed and look underneath his bed. And there was the, 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 uh, oh, wow. crucifix. That is so, wild. Yeah, two kind of cool yeah. little moments. And, you know, I've, I, I haven't seen my mom. I haven't really heard my mom. I haven't had a dream visitation, which is, those were all kind of strange things for me because my mom was so into the paranormal like I was. I thought for sure she would come through. But I think I've also, the grieving has been so brutal for me losing my mom because we're, we were best buddies that I'm probably not letting her through the way she would have been able to. So she found other ways. Twice I asked for her to return my, my crucifix and twice the crucifix showed up within hours. It's crazy. So I love that. I love that was probably one of my more favorite moments that you never got to see on TV. I love that story. Thank you. All right. Oh, I think Carly just froze. It's been a weird. Yeah, you guys session. keep dropping in and out on me on this. I feel and like we've we're never, to you. literally that has never ha like we don't do that. Like we restart our routers. Everything's great. Sorry. No we worries. really appreciate you joining us today, Dave, and I appreciate pleasure. you being um, patient with me. I'm so sorry for the delay. That was not supposed to happen i blame leap year leap yeah. year yeah is there anything that you would like to leave with us before we go is there any advice you could give to any of our listeners or followers that you feel is important i the main thing i tell people is don't walk in a place of fear uh not fear of the supernatural or the natural giving that power over to somebody or something you know um it's it's demoralizing and demeaning to yourself and we all do it, but we can start to take command of that, you know, and I'm trying to remember uh, somebody, oh gosh, I, I just saw it again the other day and it was, it was a great piece of advice, but they said, um, I don't worry about things because worrying about it isn't going to solve it and it's not going to make it any better. I just see the problem and now we need to fix the problem. And I find that I have a lot more free time and I feel better about who I am than being somebody who sits there wallowing about 
the things that have happened in the past or problems that you're having right now. So sometimes it's good to to sit back and take stock of a moment and not allow fear to control your ideas, your identity, your heart, your mind, or your soul. Live in a place of love and forgiveness, which again, sounds all hippie and woo-woo for a bald guy. Um, (laughs) I think, uh, I, I honestly believe that if you can give over to that, you'll find more peace in your life. And I'm still a work in progress and I fight depression and anxiety all the time. It's a part of who I am. Um, but I'm still here. So if anything, I hope that people can look at a Dave Schrader and say, well, that guy's fought depression and anxiety and and a failed suicide attempt. And he's still here. Then maybe I can stay a little longer and, you know, find those reasons to, to live and find those reasons to feel better and don't let the, the darkness in right. Titanic did not sink because it hit a, a iceberg. The iceberg tore a hole in the side. The water getting inside Titanic is what sunk Titanic. So that's like bad juju and bad words. And it's it's opening yourself up to allow the negativity people throw at you inside your ship. That's what will drown you. If you can stay afloat and just push that water out, bilge it back out, you don't need it. You don't have to be hateful giving it back to somebody else. But just understand that's not my problem. That's your anger misdirected at me for something else. And, you know, those are those are some life lessons I, I think we all need to learn and uh, apply. And I'm sure my friends and family watching there go, yeah, use it more in your own life, Dave. I do. <laughs> I do. And that's Easier what's kept me alive. Than done. <laughs> well, it's kept me alive 56 years. So I do it when I need to do it. But I firmly believe in intention, manifestation, and empathy for yourself, for the world around you, and for the people you care about. Absolutely. And where can we find your book? Oh, thanks for asking. My brand new <laughs> book is out and it's called Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness. And you can buy it at my website, Paranormal 60. You can get a signed copy just like this one, or you can buy it on Amazon. So wherever you're watching the show or listening to the show, you can get it on Amazon. Or at Phenomicon, right? Yes, I will be at Phenomicon again this year. I'm so excited to be a part of that. And I'll be signing, bringing both books with me again, my other side book or the uh, t- uh, the Theater of the Mind book. So you can always reach out to me too at Dave at Paranormal60.com is my email uh, if you have stories, uh, thoughts, ideas, or just want some insight uh, or a friend to vent to, I'm the guy. So feel free to do that. And then you can join me Mondays and Wednesdays on YouTube on the Paranormal 60 YouTube channel and uh, share in my adventures and conversations with people all around the world talking about every element of the strange and supernatural. Sweet. Thank you. Ladies, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. This was amazing. If you loved what you heard today, please consider leaving us a review. Death Becomes Us is an Emotional Pictures production produced by Sarah Nichols and Alex Eisenstein.